Hi, my name is Jack Radicke, and today we're going to be talking about gene editing, specifically about the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which holds some incredible possibilities within the genetics community. Now, before we dive in and discuss just exactly what CRISPR is, I thought it would be helpful to recap just a little bit about genetics to help us through this discussion. First and foremost, our genetic makeup is defined by DNA. DNA is the blueprint, uh, the template for all aspects of a biological organism. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is formed through a deoxyribose sugar, a phosphate group, and the combination of four nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. These nucleotides are paired together and form, along with the phosphate and sugar, a double helix structure as seen in this picture. Now, there are many types of DNA, but we're not particularly concerned about the various types of DNA today. Today, we're going to be focusing primarily on chromosomes. Chromosomes are strands of DNA that are found in the nucleus of eukaryotes that contain hundreds or thousands of genes. This, of course, began with Gregor Mendel's pea plant experiment, where simple inheritance was attributed to genes which are inherited from parent to offspring during reproductive cell division and fertilization. Now, during fertilization and reproductive cell division, or meiosis, offspring inherit two subunits of genes, or alleles, from parents, and the aggregation of which form the genotype or the genetic makeup for an organism. Now, we're not going to cover much about inheritance for the purposes of this video. However, it is important to remember that alleles generally present as dominant or recessive. Now, dominant alleles are presented in the phenotype or the physical expression of the genotype, which can be influenced by the environment. And it's also important to remember that inheritance and phenotypic expression are much more complicated than simple Mendelian inheritance. Phenotypic expression of certain traits is often defined by many genes or polygenic traits, and in some cases, many traits are defined by one gene, or pleiotropic traits. Genetic inheritance is a very complex topic that's influenced by many, many factors. So, back to our discussion on CRISPR. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. <laughs> now that's a mouthful, so one more time. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. CAS stands for CRISPR-associated sequences, which are generally genes or proteins. So, what does this even mean? CRISPR-CAS systems are associated with adaptive immunity in both bacterium and archaea, as well as some other prokaryotic organisms. These repeats were discovered in 1987 by scientist Yoshizumi Ishino and his colleagues. These repeats were later proven to drive adaptive immunity from viruses and other foreign organisms and invaders in bacteria and archaea. Essentially, CRISPR-CAS systems allow for these organisms and their offspring to gain immunity from foreign bodies. Now, how does this work? According to their 2012 book, CRISPR-CAS Systems, RNA-Mediated Adaptive Immunity in Bacteria and Archaea, Rodolphe Barangu and John Van der Oost state that mechanistically, CRISPR-CAS systems drive immunity through three major steps. Number one, acquisition where immunization occurs by uptake of foreign DNA sequence and integration as new CRISPR spacers. Number two, expression, where CAS proteins are produced and CRISPR-encoded transcripts are processed into small interfering CRISPR RNAs, or CRRNAs. Number three, interference, where CRRNA, CAS, ribonucleic protein complexes mediate homologous target recognition and specific cleavage. <laughs> now let's break that all down. In my research, I found a great graphic distributed by the British Society for Gene and Cell Therapy. First, a gene or cluster of genes are identified that are affected by whatever affliction scientists are trying to correct or whatever virus the bacteria or archaea are trying to fight. Next, a cell is transfected with a DNA plasmid that expresses both the CIS protein and a sequence of guide RNA that matches the gene of interest. Essentially, a protein associated with the CRISPR cuts both strands of the DNA. The protein and the gRNA recognize where to cut according to PAM sequences, or PAM sequences. PAM sequences are similar to start and stop codons in protein synthesis. The PAM sequence is a common series of base pairs that help target the specific area of DNA for binding. Now, this also helps prevent the protein from cutting out other important parts of the DNA that, that could leave the organism susceptible to other foreign bodies and viruses, as well as create unwanted mutations in the DNA. GRNA binds to the DNA, effectively replacing one strand, and is then used for further cell reproduction in a much later process. Once the target segment of DNA has been excised, two processes could then be used to correct the target gene. First, by a process called non-homologous end joining. Essentially, the cell attempts to repair the cleaved or sliced DNA. However, because the sequence is interrupted and unlike the excised sequence, the gene is silenced and therefore is not expressed. 
In the second process, homology direct repair, the end sequence of the DNA replacement is the same as the end sequence of the excised DNA. Thus, there is a good chance that the DNA will recombine and be expressed in the form of a new gene. Now, while this infographic makes it seem like a relatively simple process, there are many factors that can interfere with this process. First and foremost, for this process to be successful without any unintended side effects, the target gene or cluster must be the only place in the organism in which the sequence appears in that order, accompanied by the general PAM sequence. Second, the success rate is not 100% even if this first condition is met. According to neuroscientist Ajimiti Kaikas of the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, CRISPR is only about 80% effective. More troubling, Novartis found that CRISPR-Cas9 editing can trigger a mutation in the P53 gene, which is a DNA's defense mechanism, either repairing the DNA or destroying the cell when a malfunction is detected. Mutations in the P53 gene can cause cancer, meaning that CRISPR-Cas9 editing can directly cause cancer in recipient organisms. Now, this is not by any means the only critique of CRISPR gene editing. There are also concerns over the ethicality of gene editing. One of the more promising possibilities of gene editing is the ability to edit the germline of human embryos. This means that there is a potential for the adaptive immunity against many viruses that affect humans, including the HIV virus. This also introduces a means for a trend called designer babies, in which gene therapy, which can include CRISPR-Cas9 editing, is used to hand-pick traits for offspring. For example, a parent may have the potential to choose features such as eye and hair color, along with other phenotypic expressions for their child in the near future. Both of these raise ethical debates over the use of gene editing. Now, some critics argue that the prevention of certain viruses such as HIV by such an invasive and potentially dangerous process like gene editing is not worth the risk and thus should not be used on human embryos. Others fear that the use of gene editing to select for certain traits is a glorified form of eugenics, a process of breeding in which the quote unquote desirable traits are selected for to create an improved human population. Now, these are very real concerns and concerns that will have to be addressed as this technology grows more prevalent. However, other potentially beneficial uses for CRISPR gene editing include increased productivity and food security and production of crop and livestock, the ability to control populations in the wild, such as eradicating malaria carrying mosquitoes, and the ability to prevent or even correct certain genetic disorders, such as sickle cell anemia or specific kinds of muscular dystrophy. Now, these benefits have the potential to greatly improve the lives of people in places where food security is low and where uh, there are high concentrations of disease-carrying animals. Thus, a nuanced debate must happen about why and when gene editing should be In November 2018, it was confirmed that scientist He Jiang Kui had successfully implanted embryos that had been genetically modified by the CRISPR-Cas9 process in an attempt to give some degree of protection against HIV for the recipient's lifetime. The study was met with controversy, as many believe that this was a violation of ethical standards. So how then do we proceed with gene editing, and when is the appropriate time to use this mechanism for the human population? Today we very briefly covered the process of CRISPR-Cas editing and its potential for future generations. As we move forward, we must ask ourselves, to what extent do we want gene editing to affect our everyday lives? Innovations such as this have the potential to further human evolution at a staggering rate, However, we must fairly weigh the potentially negative effects that this could have on the human population in the very near future. Thank you.